Don't, yeah. don't say that in front of Mark. Yeah. He'll, he'll never. Well, Miami was. Um, thanks a lot. My name is Jim Groom. I am the Director of Teaching and Learning Technologies at the University of Mary Washington. And um, this panel uh, is going to be discussing, so if the first panel was focused on open educational resources and did a fine job of framing that for the community, and I hope we can pick up on some of the discussion uh, that was happening after that panel in the end session. So keep those questions and keep those concerns because we can return to them in the fourth panel. That's part of what this is about. Um, but we're going to focus the, or shift the focus a little bit and talk about what we mean when we talk about not only infrastructure more specifically, but this notion of open infrastructure. And I really liked some of the notions that came up in the first panel, um, particularly Daniel DeMar brought up the question of, you know, we have the open educational resources, we have the faculty creating these resources, but we don't have the technology to share them efficiently and effectively across the state. And that's a really good question and issue that I think this group and policy more generally could start imagining and thinking about. I don't know if there's one solution, um, but I think that can get us to thinking about more broad terms of how we share across institutions and also how we get credit for that as faculty um, and as staff. That's a big question that was raised in, those, in that discussion that I think is worth thinking about and kind of reflecting on. Um, but before we get to all that, I want to introduce 
this illustrious panel of infrastructure folks who will be infrastructuring for you. Okay? <laughs> Thank you. It doesn't cost any extra to get infrastructured at OpenVA. FYI. <laughs> Big fan. Thanks for laughing. <laughs> I've always liked you. Okay. Um, so let's talk about this, and I'm going to actually introduce our panelists in the order that they'll be presenting. So that's clear for us, for them, and for you. Um, first up, we have Rusty Waterfield from uh, Old Dominion University. Uh, he's currently the Assistant Vice President for Information Technology Services. Um, he's been at ODU since 1986, which I think is pretty awesome. And that means he has a long view of how IT works over time and space. And he'll be talking to us in a couple of our definitional um, approaches before we get started, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and he'll be talking to us about how ODU is moving forward with cloud infrastructure and what that means. Um, Ryan Brazell, who's an instructional technology specialist at UMW, um, is here. He's been here for over a year now, and it's great to have him in Virginia <laughs> fighting the fight. Um, he works specifically with developing faculty to explore teaching and learning technologies, and he's going to be discussing today the process of bringing UMW's blogging platform, UMW Blogs, to Amazon Web Services, or say it another way, to the cloud, and what that means. And we'll talk about this thing about the cloud, because I don't want it to be a, a kind of buzzword. I want it to be something we grapple with as a concept. So there's that. Martha Burtis, also from the University of Mary Washington, we come in droves, right? <laughs> We're like termites or cockroaches. Like, we don't come one or two. We come. Stop, Jeff. This is a good thing. <laughs> People will remember us. Cockroaches, UMW. Um, anyway, <laughs> I already screwed that one up. Recently named the director of the Digital Knowledge Center, um, which is a new program happening at uh, the university, or a new center at the University of Mary Washington. And it speaks to some of the questions that came up in the earlier panel about support and how we support some of the um, programs we're building at UMW and beyond. So I hope she at least talks about that for a second or two. Um, Working on organ she's been working on and organizing a project we're working, which will be the focus of her discussion, uh, Domain of One's Own. Domain of One's Own gives every student and faculty at Mary Washington their no own domain name and web host. And we'll talk about what it means to bring infrastructure to the individual level and how we think about that more broadly. Um, finally, Chad Wallenberg, who was previously the senior network engineer at Southside Virginia Community College, has recently been promoted to CIO. So let's give him a big round of applause. That's awesome. Congratulations. Um, and he'll be talking today about, I think, an issue that's on everyone's mind when we talk about infrastructure and questions like that. And that's the notion of purchasing and how we get around some of the state questions about purchasing and sharing across our institutions. And if someone is using Amazon Web Services or some other service at their university, how do we, as a sister school, kind of you know, use that to do that as well. And that's, a, that's an issue that we're running into right now at Mary Washington with Amazon Web Services. So I'm really interested to hear that. But before we get going with the panel, um, I want to just do two quick things. And luckily, Rusty has um, offered to talk to us a bit about the broader view of the history of IT and what that means for this question of um, cloud infrastructure that we're going to be talking about. And we're going to talk a little bit just about what we mean about the cloud, and then the panel will get started. So we wanted to start not with assumptions, but with a couple of definitions. Um, so Rusty, I'll let you go first, and then we'll talk a bit about the cloud, and then our panel will start. Thanks. Thanks, Rusty. Good morning. Um, just this past uh, uh, Thursday, we had the opportunity to say goodbye and retirement celebration for two individuals that had over 70 years' experience uh, at uh, ODU in, in IT. And I talked about, you know, they started supporting IT before there were PCs, Macs, Internets, Web, actually before terminals. So, you know, I can go way back on infrastructure, but I'm not going to do that for the sake of time this morning. Uh, and so I'm going to give you... First and foremost, what, you know, what is the past history of infrastructure, let's say, over the last five, eight, maybe 10 years? So I'm going to start off first with what is infrastructure? Um, and if you can think of it as the, you know, the combined hardware, software, network, data center, you know, in order to deliver an IT service to an, an end user. So specifically, that is, you know, in, in most cases, 
a server, some storage, network, data center, and, and you know, that it takes to run a particular uh, application. So things like the associated people, processes, documentation, that's not part of the infrastructure for our conversation uh, uh, today. So over the last, I mean, certainly over the last five years, but even before that, we've seen this huge shift between an infrastructure that's defined by physical devices to more that you're hearing around virtual, virtualizing your, your infrastructure. And if you think about why this is the, the particular case, you have to understand what does it take in order to run an application. So every application, you know, requires, in, in from the past, required a lot of dedicated infrastructure. Every application wanted its, you know, needed its own server. Why? Because it could not coexist in the operating system with multiple applications. And so you're not going to run your banner or your ERP system and your website on the same server infrastructure. They just don't coexist. They don't play together, right? And so if the application cannot coexist on the OS, well, the OS also wants to own the hardware. It, it wants to control the hardware. So that means if you have every, for every operating system, you've got to have a server and storage and network. And for every application, you've got to have a unique hardware, I mean, OS. Guess what? For every application, you've got to have server, storage, network, right? And so as you can see, as applications grow, guess what happens? Your physical infrastructure grows and grows and grows, right? And so it becomes very difficult to manage, very difficult to control cost. Um, and in our business, we called it server sprawl. I mean, next thing you know, you woke up and you're looking at your data center, you had 10 servers and now you have 400. You know, you're saying, wow, thinking of all the heating and cooling and cost and support and guess what? The, the, we couldn't manage utilization. Some applications, you could get it fine-tuned right. Then that application, you know, right number of processors, right number of memory, it worked great. Some, boy, you overestimated and you got low utilization, wasted resources. Some you underestimated, now you're stuck. You know, do I have to replace, right? So very cost inefficient uh, when it comes to the server sprawl and this physical uh, infrastructure. No way to scale, right? There's no way for me to say, okay, here's peak demand, I'm gonna scale this, and then when I don't, I can scale it back. Did not exist uh, in the physical side. And of course, when you know, our faculty come to us and say, we need this, if we got to go buy a server, rack it, stack it, attach it, you know, get storage, they say, never mind, right? And more than likely, they went out and got something to put it under a desk and tell anybody. And you know, now server sprawl goes outside the data center, and it's all over the campus and creates lots of issues, right? So the challenges of the physical uh, infrastructure were uh, and continue to be, in a lot of cases, uh, challenging. But the good news is that we're moving from physical to virtual, right? And so, um, not to be too technical here, but really we're trying to abstract the physical components um, in the infrastructure so that the operating system doesn't have to control the hardware, doesn't have to control the server. And so what gets inserted in between that is uh, uh, a, a virtual component that makes the OS think they own the hardware, but the virtual system owns the hardware. And so in that case, now I can actually run multiple operating systems on top of that virtual control mechanism so that each one of them thinks they own the hardware. And I can partition that hardware to meet the demands of the particular application. So instead of having five servers to run five different applications, I can have one physical server running five different applications, and I can control uh, by good monitoring tools how many resources are needed for each of those applications, uh, and I can move them around from server to server uh, fairly easily without even interruption to the end user. So you can see already where that can create a lot of uh, efficiencies. Um, and I'm, I gave the example of server, but you can do the same thing for storage and you also can do the same thing in your network. So you can really virtualize your entire infrastructure. Um, gives you great flexibility, and you also can be dynamic, right? If I need to build something and tear it down, very easy. Just I build a virtual system, tear it down. If I need to expand resources, I can say add a little more memory here, give it more processing time here, and I can balance that around my my infrastructure, which was impossible on the physical side, and certainly from a cost perspective, 
right? I mean, the cost of heating and cooling, all of this, you know, equipment, as well as the inefficiencies of buying servers that were well underutilized, just drove up the cost. Um, and then it allows us to be a lot more agile, so that we can, you know, build something and tear it down, you know, pretty quickly and pretty uh, effectively. And so this kind of leads into the discussion of how did we get to cloud? And so I'm just going to transition here. So the cloud, can, if you can think about this, scales even greater than you can, let's say, in an on-premise infrastructure that's just virtualized for our institution. And so if I can say I can achieve efficiencies just at ODU by virtualizing my infrastructure, now think of a provider like Amazon Web Services who say, I can do this to great scale and reducing everybody's cost by, you know, uh, uh, virtualizing, uh, you know, making it easy to provision, deprovision, making it easy to create on-demand things. So uh, one last thing. This goes all the way down to the desktop. And we've had great success at ODU in virtualizing our, our desktop environment. I give one quick example in our College of Education where they have a lab. They've actually replaced all the PCs with thin clients, thin desktops, um, and th that allows them to share the software both while the students are in that lab and then they can access that same software that they have limited license for uh, remotely using the virtual desktop. So it goes all the way down to the desktop if you can think about those efficiencies. Good. And so I was going to kind of push on the idea of cloud, but I really think Rusty did a, a brilliant job of framing out what the actual change in infrastructure we're looking at is and how that works. So to give you a very specific example, Ryan Brazell is going to talk about uh, some of the work happening at Mary Washington. And I was told I need to reframe the cockroaches. It's locusts. We come like locusts. Okay? So great, Ryan. Great. Can everybody hear me from up here? Can you hear me on the live stream too, Andy, or do you need me to go down there? You're fine down there. In the back? Okay, I'll speak up a little bit for folks in the back. Um, so what I'm going to tell you about a little bit today is um, UMW's blogging platform that Jim mentioned earlier. It's called UMW Blogs. Um, most of you are on the network, or many of you are. If you want to check it out while I'm talking, you can go to umwblogs.org. It will be up. Um, <laughs> so, uh, uh, so let's bring it down. Yeah, exactly. Quickly. Everybody get on. Bring it down. Um, <laughs> No, so uh, UMW Blogs is a platform that's been available at the University of Mary Washington for seven years. It started in 2007, um, and it's open in a lot of ways. So when we talk about things being open, there's a lot of different ways that can happen, right? Um, so it's open um, in the sense that it uses WordPress, which is an open source um, application, an, an open source piece of software. Um, and that allows us not only to get in and see the code, but also to edit the code. If we have a faculty member who wants to do something really special that WordPress's really large universe of plugins and themes does not provide, we can actually do something about that. We have people who are very talented on our staff who are able to do that, mostly Martha, also Tim Owens, who unfortunately couldn't be here today. Um, we can do that. So it's, it's open in the sense that you know, we get it for free, but then we can also make modifications and then share those modifications with others. We've done that a little bit. The University of British Columbia has done the same thing. UBC has put a lot of plugins for WordPress out there. So that's one way that it's open. Another way that it's open is that anybody with the UMW email address, whether they're a faculty member, a staff member, a student, anyone can go on and create um, a space for themselves. Um, they can use it as a blog. They can use it as a portfolio. They can use it as a staging site or a place to test. They can use it as a database. We have um, a number of, of uh, faculty who are using it as um, a place for students to enter and then display data. Um, so it's open in the sense that anybody in our community can use it in any way they want without having to go through us. Um, the, the, um, our department, the DTLT, does do a lot of work with faculty to integrate it really tightly with the curriculum, um, but that doesn't, doesn't have to be the only way that people approach it from. So that's another way in which UMW Blogs is open. More recently, we decided, um, sort of out of necessity, that we actually needed to move UMW Blogs from the server it was currently living on to something that was beefier, um, and hopefully also to make it easier for other people to use the setup that we have, or to, you know, we've, we've been doing this for seven years. We've gotten pretty much all of the kinks worked out, although we do still have issues from time to time, as one is wont to do. I see Jeff giggling over here, because uh, he knows. Uh, it happens, right? But we've gotten most of the kinks worked out of using WordPress at an institutional level. Um, and just to give you an idea, we have, I think at this point, over 8,000, almost 9,000 individual sites 
um, on this. We, we have never deleted a site um, except if an individual requests it. So this isn't like we're refreshing this from year to year. We have a lot of legacy content on the site, right? Um, so it's really big. Um, and a lot of times when we have problems, people can't help us because they say, your site's too big. <laughs> Thanks, that's great. Um, no, so um, anybody can go in and do that. And we decided, you know, it, it's been really successful over the last seven years. Um, but you know, Rusty did a great job of talking about sort of the way that servers are often architected and you have sort of one server to do one thing. Well, we had one server doing multiple things. We had one server hosting WordPress itself, um, running Apache, running the database, doing the file storage. All of that was located on one server. Um, and that sort of worked for, for most of the time. Um, but when you think about demand on university services, and not just technical services, but any services, it doesn't look like a straight line, right? You have periods Sunday night, everybody's doing their homework, and then sort of as Friday and Saturday approach, demand's way down here, and there's nobody in the library and nobody on the website, right? Um, so the, the model that we had of having one server run all of that um, wasn't really meeting that. We weren't really able to meet peak need on Sunday nights really well and really, really consistently. Meanwhile, we have way too much server for those Friday night, Saturday night times when people are out partying and not doing their homework. Um, so we were trying to figure out how do we deal with that and how do we do that in a way that we can actually help other people. So Tim Owens and I spent uh, a weekend basically um, moving our, and sort of fragmenting our setup. So instead of having both the file storage and um, the database and the web application all on the same server, we actually split those pieces apart and put some of them onto Amazon, AWS, Amazon Web Services. Uh, we were able to do this through a pilot um, in conjunction with our IT department. They basically agreed that, sure, we'll let you run a pilot, we'll, we'll, we'll try it out, and we sort of quietly put our production services onto the pilot. Maybe <laughs> 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 we're not so quietly anymore. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and so what we have now is, is a more fragmented but ultimately much stronger, um, more consistent system. So we still have the, the server we were running before remains the file storage place, and we're, we're working on moving that. But right now it's staying where it is, because we're in the middle of the semester and we don't want to screw too much up. Um, we've moved the database to um, AWS's database service, and then we have an EC2 instance running Apache, running the web server. So now we have these three things running in conjunction. Um, and we haven't done this yet, but what we're looking forward to doing, probably again at the end of the semester after grades are in and nobody's going to freak out about things being down, um, we are going to actually um, make those servers elastic so that at any given time they're meeting the need that the actual, um, that the visitors are demanding. So when we have this really high demand on Sunday evenings, um, Amazon can actually, you can tell Amazon, I want you to just meet the demand. And so when it goes up, I want you to provide more beefiness. I want you to give more memory or CPU or whatever's needed on that Sunday night. And then as the um, demand starts to come down, it can actually automatically drop that. So you're not sort of maintaining this level, this flat level that isn't really appropriate for any time that you actually need it. Um, so that's sort of been our adventure with UMW Blogs. Um, you know, it, it, it took us about a weekend, I would say, of 24 straight hours almost of us having lots of caffeine and, um, and staying up and sort of avoiding our families. Um, but it's, so far it's been really good. I mean, we did this right before the start of the semester because the start of the semester, as you all know, is sort of the peak time for you know, people are getting on, they're trying to figure out how to log into things. That's just sort of the, the peak period. There's three weeks at the beginning when everybody sort of runs around crazy. Um, and it behaved admirably. We were actually having problems with other university resources at the time, but not UMW blogs, um, which we were really thrilled about. Um, so it, that, that's sort of our, our story of openness with UMW blogs. Um, and I'd be happy to take, uh, when we get to the Q&A, either technical questions or sort of idea theory questions. One of the things, too, um, about that setup that I thought was interesting when Ryan and, and Tim were doing this work is, you know, you pay for what you use. Yeah. So rather than, like Russ, you said, you get one server and you pay for that level of server for the whole semester, you pay for the usage, which in our case was not necessarily what we were paying for a server on a monthly basis. It was actually cheaper. And maybe we can redirect resources into different elements. So it's kind of one of the best ways I've heard this kind of model explained is through notion of it's kind of more like a gas metered utility. Like as you use it, that's what you pay to use. And it's a very different way of thinking about infrastructure and hardware. And it's part of wrapping your head around what this idea of the cloud is. 
So uh, it's compelling stuff. Thank you very much. Well, and actually one other thing really quickly. Uh, the other thing that we're hoping to do later is we can actually, through Amazon Web Services, we can take a snapshot of the way that we have our server set up. So our EC2 instance that's running the web server, um, we can take a snapshot of that and then make that available to people through Amazon. Amazon has like a template area that you can say, what kind of server do I want to set up? And so we could actually share that with anybody else who uses AWS. So another way that we're hoping to make UMW blog sort of open to the community. Yeah, it's an interesting model, the idea of imaging. Yeah. So like you could take a model like the UMW blog system, completely image it, and that's something ODU could use. Right. Or VCU could use. Exactly. Or, um, you know, Southside Community College. So there's that talk about sharing infrastructure and thinking about infrastructure that came up in the first session, that this is some of the ways we could start getting at that. Right. Now, um, you kind of see a model here. Rusty has talked about kind of institutionally, and he'll return to that as well. Um, Ryan talked about a very specific application use of this open infrastructure. And Martha Burtis right now is going to talk about what happens when you bring infrastructure to the individual level with U of W domains. So, um, yeah, I'm here to talk to you today about another project that we have at Mary Washington um, <coughs> called Domain of One's Own, or affectionately referred to as UMW Domains. Um, but to do that, I want to back up um, about 10 years <laughs> and talk a little bit about the, the story that got us to where we are with Domain of One's Own. And I think what Rusty talked about to get us started today is a really good framework um, for understanding why we ended up where, where we are with, with actually with UMW blogs and ultimately with Domain of One's Own, which is that um, in about 2004, um, we were at a point as an instructional technology department at Mary Washington where there was a lot of amazing stuff beginning to emerge on the web, a lot of possibilities that we were, we were um, really interested in pursuing and understanding, but we were really um, sort of hamstrung in terms of what we could ask our IT department to do to, su to support that. And in, in part, that had to do with the way that traditional infrastructure worked. Um, because of the constraints of what it means to stand up a physical server, like the, what's involved in standing up a physical server and then supporting that in an ongoing way, um, the idea of being able to build kind of flexible spaces for experimentation was really a, a big challenge. And I think that um, what Rusty talked about in terms of the cloud and what Ryan has talked about in terms of us migrating to AWS for UMW blogs shows us a lot of potential. Um, and we're on kind of the cusp of understanding how that is going to transform our understanding of building infrastructure for our institutions. But we weren't at that place 10 years ago, and we're not completely at that place even now. I think we're still kind of wrapping our heads around the possibilities. Um, and as a result, what we ended up doing at Mary Washington, and some people have maybe heard us talk about this before, is we went off campus to a commodity web hosting company, and we started experimenting with open source um, web hosting as a space for experimentation, almost as a sandbox. Um, starting with the instructional technologists, giving them a, a space to play and experiment and try things out, but ultimately, and within short order, expanding that and extending that as an opportunity to faculty. Um, and all along the way, and, and UMW Blogs as a system really grew out of that experimentation. We became kind of um, pretty dedicated users of WordPress. We understood the potential and the power of that as a platform. Um, and we believed that by, by making that a multi-user environment of WordPress available to our faculty and students, we could give them a taste at an at a almost enterprise level, a taste of what that open space looked like, of what working with open source software on the open web looked like. Um, but all along, um, probably starting about 2006, uh, we, we had this idea in our head that what we really needed to be able to do was to give our students this as well. Um, that it was great for us to have those spaces, it was great for our faculty to have those spaces, and to a certain degree we could give students glimpses of what that kind of open infrastructure afforded us as individuals, um, but we weren't really able to fully empower them um, to understand the potential of that space. Um, and so in 2012, um, we launched a pilot in, in partnership with our IT department um, of, of Domain of One's Own. And the concept of Domain of One's Own is that um, any student faculty or staff member at the university can get a domain name um, for the duration of their existence at the university. Uh, the university pays for that annual registration of the domain name, um, and we also give them open source web hosting that's attached to that domain name. Um, so we piloted that in 1213. Um, we launched that as a full project in 1314. So we're in the second year of that project right now. Um, and it's been, pretty, um, it's been pretty amazing to witness what it means when you take that model 
of giving essentially an open infrastructure um, to the individual and, and you extend it from, from what faculty and staff can do with that as a way to empower students to what happens when you actually put it in the hands of your students. Um, many of our students are using it within the context of a course. So it's, it's a curric there's a curricular, curricular binding to it. Um, they understand it within the, in the context of the course they're taking and the, the direction that they're getting from a faculty member about how they're expected to use it, what they're expected to build in that space. Um, but the idea is to, to use those curricular moments as a way to uh, introduce them to the potential so that they can then begin to imagine on a more personal level what that space means for them. Um, and when they graduate from the university, um, because this is all built in an open source environment on an open source LAMP stack using um, open source software, open source web applications, um, it's highly portable. Their, their space belongs to them. We tell them that all the time. Their data, their creative um, content that they're putting up there, that all belongs to them. It doesn't, it's not something that comes back to us as the institution. Um, and when they graduate, they are free to take that with them and do with it as they say please, as they please, which it, one thing that they can do is simply delete it. Um, and get rid of it, and, um, and that's something that we have to be okay with too. You know, I say this all the time, that if, if we say it's important to empower people um, by giving them open spaces and understanding the, power, the potential of those open spaces, one of the things you have to accept is that sometimes they walk away from that. Um, as long as, and my, what I always say is as long as they're making that choice wa eyes wide open, they understand what that choice means and what it represents, that, that's good, that's a good choice to make. Um, but, but in the end, they can take it with them. We're in the process right now working with our alumni office of negotiating kind of a discounted um, hosting um, uh, service through a, through a web hosting provider um, so that if they want, they don't have to go to that provider, but if they want, that's an, one easy avenue they can take um, that the, that company would migrate their content for them um, to, their, to their servers and then they would take over payment um, paying that company for their domain re registration, their web hosting once they graduate. And we do, we do give them kind of a grace period. Um, our, the goal is to get to a six month grace period. This year we actually gave students a 12 month grace period because we were still negotiating um, ways, to, the best way to get them off of the service. Um, so that's Domain of One's Own and I'm happy to talk about it more during the Q&A. Sure. Thank you. And one of the things that came up with Domain of One's Own, and this is a kind of transition to some of the stuff that Chad will talk about is, we were kind of in new territory, right? The idea is, what does it mean to buy domains? And the big question and the joke was, they're like bricks. Are they bricks? Like, what does it mean to buy a domain for students? And, you know, purchasing, and I, tech purchasing was like, we don't, we've never done anything like this, so how do we go about it? So one of the things we really kind of struggled with, and really hats off to Tim Owens, who, who took the leadership on kind of working with our purchasing crew, to think about what does it mean to purchase domains for students? And that's an example of something that Mary Washington worked through. So that as other faculty or other students maybe want to explore something like Domain of One's Own, we're a resource in that regard. And part of open infrastructure, kind of like what was talked about with the open educational resources, was how do we bring some of this stuff together so we know what other people have done? And how do we kind of share and pool those resources? Um, so with that, I want to hand it over to Chad to talk a little bit about uh, some of the questions of purchasing when it comes to open infrastructure. Disclaimer, I am not an expert at purchasing whatsoever. <laughs> I, I, I can see a lot of uh, people are going to ask me questions about purchasing. I'm going to do my best, but I think we made uh, some smart decisions several years ago. Our website was aging. Our southside.edu website was aging. We were sitting, it was sitting on a virtual machine on our internal infrastructure. It was ASP.net. It was on a Windows 2003 server. and. Uh, God help us. So, <laughs> we, so we had to make a lot of interesting choices. Where are we going to host this, this new website? How are we going to migrate the data off the old website to the new website? And what do we want to use in open infrastructure, which is what we're talking about? Um, so there's actually two things that went on here. The first is we had to decide, are we going to host it internally? Are we going to host it? We actually have three choices in the Virginia Community College system. Well, more than three choices, but let's talk about three choices. Do we host it internally? The, the VCCS uh, has centrally located a, a huge virtual infrastructure as well. Do we host it there? Or do we go out on our own and do we go ahead and get a, a, a virtual private server or, or something like Amazon hosted services? Um, so that was the first decision. The second decision is, are we just going to sit around on ASP.NET or are we going to go to a more open source solution? And I'm a Linux guy, so 
obviously I swayed the decision <laughs> uh, towards an open solution. But we had 20, 000, over 20,000 pages that we needed to migrate from the old site to the new site. And there, we don't have a programmer on staff. Um, well, excuse me, we have a webmaster, but there's just no way that she, she's also the Blackboard administrator at our college. There's no way she could do all that she does and migrate to a new site on a new technology. So we had to make a decision as to whether or not we were going to procure the services to migrate all that data to this new infrastructure. And that we, did, we made that decision. We, we said, yes, we're going to do that. So first we said, on, all right, is there already something in place in Virginia that we can piggyback off of? There should be, right? We have a lot of institutions that have already done stuff like this. And we searched through VASCUP contracts and other people's RFPs, and we did not find what fit our needs. And a lot of that had to do with literally the open source verbiage within the contracts that we wanted. Uh, we could not find that. So we did an RFP. And in that RFP, we included a lot of the, the open verbiage that I'm talking about. We wanted to sit on a LAMP stack, a Linux, uh, a Apache, MySQL, PHP. That's an open source stack behind the scenes. And we wanted an open content management system, which we've talked about. WordPress is one of them. In fact, most of the DCCS colleges now are either sitting on Drupal or WordPress. We didn't actually say we had a preference. We just went with open content management system, which is kind of a good thing, because if you go and you use my RFP, you could still have the option of going with multiple things, WordPress, Joomla, whatever, but it will be open, and it will be able to sit on that open stack. And we thought that was an important process of the request for proposal. So here's how this failed, and here's how this <laughs> succeeded. Uh, first, it, it, it failed because we, we, we went through the re request for proposal. We, went, they, we had I don't know, over 50 responses. They ranged from $7,000 to $230,000. Um, uh, we went with the 7000 obviously. No, we didn't. Uh, we, we went with one that was around $50,000 to migrate all the data and create this new site. We went with Drupal as the content management system. And I, I think because you know that number might sound high to you, might not. We're about a 5,000 student school. Um, but the important thing to realize is that the, this company was building modules for us. They were completely redoing the site for us. So there was, there was coding in the background, plus migrating all that data over and making it look pretty and making it searchable and, and making it user friendly. So uh, we went with this and it, it, we have a site up and you can go to it and please don't go to the mobile site. <laughs> uh, it didn't go exactly the way we had hoped. We had some problems with how the site was built. Um, things weren't done the way we wanted. Let's just say we parted ways with the company that originally built the site last year. Now, we could easily part ways with that company. Why? Yeah. Because we went with open infrastructure. That we, we owned that code, they did not. We, we owned all the content and the code. So, we, you know, heartbreaking, but we had to break ties. We took that data with us, migrated over to a new site, went with a new company. And I think that's something, if, 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 if I say anything today and you get anything out of what I'm saying is, when, when you're procuring things in Virginia, we all get to piggyback off of our procurements, right? Because I did this, you could piggyback off of it. I don't suggest doing that. But you, and you can email me for, for the RFP. But when you're thinking about, if you are gonna do an RFP or if you are gonna procure something, think about the open standards. So that, first of all, you get the advantage of it if you do ever decide to migrate, which you will, right? And second, that other people get the benefit from it as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. great. Now, we have a, we're gonna stop for a second. We are gonna build in about 25 to 30 minutes for questions and for discussion. And if you have nothing to say, don't worry, I do. Um, <laughs> but before we do, I just wanted to throw out a couple of ideas for the panel to discuss to kind of get us started. And one of those that comes up right away, and this goes to Rusty, um, he's working in the cloud infrastructure for nothing more than kind of identity management services. So it's interesting to think about questions of open and identity management in the same question and not get scared and you know, say, oh my god, we can't do it. So Rusty, I just wonder if you could speak a little bit to you know, not only the question of identity management and how you're doing that in an outsourced environment, but what that kind of looks like um, when you frame it around open. Does that make sense as a question? Sure. 
Are, are my slides over there, Jim, that I could? Yeah, they are. Yeah. Okay, sweet. One thing I, I want to do for sure is to dispel that IT organizations are scared of the cloud, right? Um, you know, it, 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 you know, the concept that, uh, you know, we don't build it and we don't maintain it, uh, you know, can be a scary transition of an IT organization. But right now, you're seeing a lot of IT organizations really working on how do I scale, how do I you know, change our business model in order to meet the, you know, the growing demands out there. Um, Great, thank you. You're welcome. So I, there, there are 10 slides here. I promise I'm going to go through them within five minutes. So, so we've been working, and I, I think just about every IT organization out there has been, has been working on developing a cloud services architecture. For us, it's three components. The first one is our identity and access management. And what I do now on campus to provision and deprovision accounts and services and access, I got to be able to do in the cloud, make it very seamless, right? And then the, the second one was, yeah, how, do I, how do I integrate data? How do I get data back and forth between on campus and the cloud, between two services in the cloud, do so securely, um, uh, quickly and effectively? And then the last one is, well, how do I procure, not just from a, an RFP standpoint, but what am I looking for when I'm going after a, 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 a cloud uh, service? So you're probably familiar with these definitions, so I'm not going to go into them in, in too much detail, but identity access management, you're, you're maintaining credentials, roles, passwords, um, being able to provision services based on role, um, you know, workflow approval, those kinds of things. If somebody changes their role, you're changing their access and, you know, those kinds of the things. So I, we, we federate with a lot of uh, other uh, uh, directories, whether it be uh, LDAP, Shibboleth is our single sign-on solution, our active directory in common. So for us in our identity ma access management system, we actually control groups and active directory from there, from our identity access management system. So you can manage a group and it'll be pushed to, to, uh, to, to that system. And then we also are part of in common, which is the, you know, the uh, internet to uh, federated uh, uh, system, which I encourage everybody to, to join. Um, but the, the idea is I can automate everything that I do on campus. We, we extend you know, to the cloud. And right now we have well over 25 uh, cloud-based services that integrate with our identity uh, access management system. So one we just announced we released this fall is Box, Box uh, File Cloud Storage. Uh, so if you're a faculty and staff, we're doing students in the spring, you, the, the account was provisioned for you based on your role in our identity access management system. So then the other, you know, the other big issue is, well, how do you move data around? Um, and so how do, how do I make it easy to be able to move data between, um, you know, a system that's on-prem or systems in the cloud or, or, or back and forth, and these types of systems are different. If, for example, if I'm uh, moving data from a database to uh, a website, do I have to write an application that does an SQL query to the database and then translate that to HTML5 and, and present it on there? And what we've been working on is developing, based on open source, we're using the MuleSoft open source uh, platform as an enterprise service bus. So that the web application makes the query in the uh, in, uh, programming environment that they're familiar with, the ESB will translate that for them. Oh, you're looking for a course schedule? That's in our ERP. Here's the query. Go get that and presents it to them in an HTML5 format. So, so our developers are developing their native language that they're used to. They don't have to worry about how do I get this data around and now I can move data from on-prem to cloud, cloud to on-prem, cloud to cloud uh, using our ESB and it's moving and architecting and managing the control and flow of that uh, particular uh, data. Uh, uh, so a good example would be um, we have a checklist in our portal when a student uh, uh, completes their application for housing, uh, which is a hosted environment. We want a check mark to appear on the portal that, oh, yep, we got your housing application. Here's the next step for you to go. Uh, we do that with our ESB. So the housing out, out there is in the cloud. It has some kind of API. The ESB knows how to manage that, and the, the portal is just writing in its native language to the ESB. 
And then the final piece of that, which I think is the most important actually in all of this, to be honest, is how do we manage our vendor, contract and vendor uh, relationships? Uh, from, from the standpoint of, okay, we used to build it and maintain it, to now we don't build it and maintain it anymore, right? And so the only way you're going to hold uh, vendors accountable is through that contract. That contract is critical, right? Um, and so what do we get that's in the contract? How do we sustain it, maintain it? You know, it, it also has to be in the contract. So uh, I'm going to jump through this real, real quick. We, we, these are statements that we have in our contract minds. I'm not going to go through into, into detail here, but we say that you have to show us that you adhere to these kinds of standards. These are recognized standards and for a secure uh, infrastructure. We want to know that you had these kind of protections uh, in your thing, and we want to be able to audit it. Uh, if you don't have something like this uh, at your institution, I encourage you to use the Cloud Security Alliance has a great matrix of which you should build into uh, a, a contract. And then your service level agreement. What is the availability? What are you going to allow them for scheduled downtime? How they back up your data? What if you need to recover because you deleted it? Will they do that? What about disaster recovery? What about the support? What happens if you find that the, that the application doesn't work like you want it to? How, what's the response that you're going to get from them? Um, and how they're going to, you know, fix that that error. Traditional things that you've maybe come to IT, you know, to look for. Now you've got to go to your vendor uh, and make sure that if you don't get it in the contract, you're not going to get it. Um, and then the data protection, which for, you know is the biggest one for us. Who owns your data? Make sure that's clear. Where's your data located? Can it be stored? Are you willing to let it be stored outside of the United States or no? Um, can they use your data even at the aggregate? Uh, level? Are you going to allow them to use your data in any way? Um, is it encrypted at rest and in transit, meaning when it's stored and being transferred, right? Um, can, if the, you get a legal request for your data, are they going to be responsive to that? Uh, breach notification. They get breached. How are you going to, you know, what are they going to do? Are they going to tell you, uh, you know, are they going to pick up the cost? Uh, and then how do you exit from that, right? Um, from the whole thing. How, how are you going to get your data back, you know, at the end of the contract? And of course, vendor relationships, the, the standards. You know, you, you lock into a cost and you have a term contract, but after that, what happens? Are they just going to stick it to you? You have some kind of escalation. They can say they can only go CPI or, you know, 5% year over year. Um, what about their employees? You do background checks on them. Do you require uh, you know that and your ability to audit, uh, audit and what are the grounds for termination if they do something that's violation of the contract are you you know are you allowed to terminate and those types of things become really critical uh, when you're doing that and then the last one is what about mergers and acquisitions they get acquired you know what happens uh, they merge with somebody you know what happens so you have to start thinking that everything that you expect from an IT unit you now have to build into a contract and be able to manage that in the vendor relationship, uh, you know, with with the cloud. So, you know, for us, we we are working very hard to embrace the cloud at every possible moment, right? And every opportunity because we see it scale and you can do some unique things, right? But our identity access management and our data uh, enterprise service bus are critical for you know for us, so that we we see the day where we can provision a service for semester four a course and have accounts out there for that system and tear it down at you know at the end. That's that's where we want to be uh, over over time. Thanks. Yeah, and that's actually, it raises a good point, and I'm going to open it up to questions in just a second, but it raises a good point about what service OpenVA could possibly serve, not only you, but your communities more broadly. And listening to Rusty speak about some of these issues, which I think face us all. For example, our learning management service, our learning management system Canvas is in the cloud, and it's managed remotely. And these are issues I think every single institution has to deal with. So one of the things OpenVA has been talking about is do we have distributed sessions across these various universities that talk about this openly and share it, and these groups come in? So that's something you'll be hearing more about with OpenVA as a service to kind of bring someone, whether it be Rusty, I don't want to volunteer him, or someone who's talking about these very issues um, on a very pointed um, level at the Virginia State level, and how we can share some of these resources and start working on this together, and hopefully a repository. So with that, I'm going to open it up to questions. 
um, for anyone who has any question for any of our panelists. And, and while you're all thinking, can I actually address one yes. question that came up on the um, hashtag? Where's Tom Geary? <laughs> Here. Great. Um, so Tom asked a question on um, Twitter about UMW blogs and can you mount that within Blackboard? Um, is that a privacy question or a grading question or both? Both, I okay. guess. I'm not sure which schools make it so you have to have all your grading or work done inside Blackboard because of identity issues. Sure. Sorry. <laughs> Sure, so, so Tom's question is about um, you know, privacy issues, grading issues, if you have sort of this open system, how do you do that um, on an institutional level? Um, one of the ways that we do that, there's a couple different ways. WordPress does actually have some nice privacy options that, um, that we actually right now have a women, women's and gender studies class that's happening and they're talking about a lot of really hot button issues, race, gender, harassment online, um, citizenship status, lots of things that you know the teacher doesn't necessarily want them getting thrown into the public fray while they're sort of working through those discussions, right? So that side is actually um, locked down a little bit where you have to be able to log in with the UMW username and password to even see that. So there are privacy controls on a blog by blog level um, that if you own a blog, you can control, is it open to the world or can only certain people see it? So that's the privacy part. Um, we actually do have, um, you know, as much as we talk about UMW blogs and UMW domains, we also do have an LMS on campus. Our LMS administrator is right back in the back of the room. Lisa um, came. Um, and she does a great job of, of administering Canvas, um, which is our LMS. And we have a lot of faculty that use those three in combination. It's not, this isn't a competition between those three systems. It's which pieces and parts of these do you want to use? And so we do have faculty that when they do their grading, it's through Canvas. And it's in that way because Canvas is really good at grading and WordPress isn't. And the <laughs> domain of one's own isn't necessarily. Let's, yeah. you know, we try to use all the different systems for what they're good at. So it doesn't have to be you use WordPress or Blackboard. You can use the both in combination. Um, and actually through domain of one's own, are sort of, we're thinking about ways that we can actually tie those things more closely together so that you can grade students' work more easily than having, you know, in two disparate places. So it's, I just wanted to address that. And it's one of the things that's really exciting about you know, the fact that we use Canvas, one of the things that Canvas allows us to do is to access APIs. And for those of you who don't know, I know, I'm still trying to wrap my head around what an API is, so I'm a good person to explain it. It's an application <laughs> programming interface which actually lets you get a certain amount of data from one application and share it with another. So our WordPress or our domain of one's own could grab information from Canvas, like a student roster for a class, and pull that into a blog. And so what we're starting to think about how we can get information from one system and share it with another, this is exactly what Rusty said. And this kind of notion of the API, which I think all of us are going to have to wrap our head around a little bit as we move forward, is you know, the way in which these applications that are out there are sharing work. And Canvas has something called LTIs. And I know a lot of people are thinking about the very issues that Daniel DeMar brought up around taking content out of one system and pulling it into another seamlessly. And so that's a large issue that this open infrastructure is going to make possible, if that makes any sense. Absolutely. We got a question front. Okay. First of all, I think what you're doing is Okay. Hold on for the mic. Thank you. Um, with both the um, UMW blogs and the domain of one's own, both great and exciting applications. And I, I have my students use a WordPress blog, and they tell stories of their identity development and all of those sticky, icky issues that you're talking about. But my, my two questions for you are, um, one, how did you get your IT department, hi, Rusty, um, <laughs> to, to go on? <laughs> <laughs> With with um with with embracing this because I, I I went through quite a battle to get um, WordPress running on um, ODU servers so I'm curious how you how you did that initial part and then the second part how you got so much buy-in I mean you have all these teachers using WordPress which is awesome I mean we've got a lot of teachers in our English department um, using it but I, I haven't and I roped some other education teachers into using WordPress this last semester, but I'm really impressed with the incredible buy-in. So how, how did you get it started? How did you convince the IT folks, and then how did you get everybody on board? I'll talk about the history, you talk about the buy-in. Yeah. <laughs> um, we were really lucky when, when all of this started that we had a CIO um, at Mary Washington who was very, very supportive of the idea of essentially not hosting this in IT. Um, so none of these services have ever been stood up in IT. They've always been outsourced. Um, and, and I won't lie to you, like if we hadn't had the right person in the right position at that point, I don't know that we would be telling the story that we're telling right now. 
Um, now, that said, that person is no longer and hasn't been at Mary Washington for many years. What happened was we were able to build enough critical mass around that while, we, while he was there. He was our CIO, Chip German. Um, while he was there, that when he left, there was no way to dismantle it. <laughs> like, there, there were enough faculty and students at that point who were using it and dependent on it and, 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 and wanted it um, that had become part of the air that we breathed and, and it was just, and, and from there we were able to c c keep building on top of that, that legacy. Yeah. So I know that's not the best answer, but that's the honest one. Yeah. <laughs> so. um, well, in, in terms of buy-in, um, there's a, you know, a many, many approaches that we've taken. Um, I think one of the most important things, and Jeff may, may have input on this, um, but uh, we really practice what we preach. So one of the things that Martha talked a little bit about um, back in 2004 was the DTLT started experimenting with their own spaces online um, we call it eating your own dog food. Yes, that too. Yes, exactly. Um, and, and, and started experimenting not only with being online, but specifically with WordPress. And so before we ever asked faculty or students to invest themselves in this, the department invested itself first and said, we're going to take a couple of years. We're going to figure this out. We're going to make sure that this is a platform that's going to work for all of these things. Um, and so there was practice within the department ahead of time. Um, and then, then after that, and even now, um, you know, we talk a lot about what we do at the DTLT, but one thing we don't talk about a lot is the hours and hours and hours that all of us spend on faculty development and on working one-on-one -on -one with faculty or in groups with faculty and really doing things and saying, look, like, this might be, um, a, you know, for some people it's a little bit scary to think about going online and changing the way that you've taught after 20 years. Um, and, but we just, we go to people and we meet with them one-on-one. -on -one. There's one faculty member I've been working with all summer who has been doing phenomenal work. Um, and this is, she's only been online and teaching online for a year and now she is going to be proposing an online course to teach. And it's because of sort of the way our department really rallies around and is willing to spend that time. Faculty development isn't sort of the secondary thing that we do. It's really one of the primary things that we do. Um, and so we're willing to invest our time in, our, in ourselves into that. And we're also very lucky to have faculty who share the Absolutely. work they do with each other. Absolutely. Um, and, and, and providing opportunities for them to do that and to witness each other's work. Um, you know, some, some of them get inspired by working one-on-one -on -one with an instructional technologist. Some of that need to see it from a, a peer. Sure. Some of them need pressure maybe from their students yeah. to, to try out new things. So there's, there's a lot of different mechanisms there. But, you know, it's, it's no one single solution. It's kind of a, a holistic approach. And Jennifer, it's a lot like the work you've done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like the work you've done with engaging your students around that has kind of become contagious where entire departments like the history department at UMW run by Jeff McClurkin, which you'll hear more about in a bit, like they've taken this as an ethos for the department to really start reframing what digital means for an entire department. And that's a kind of conversation that has to be born of a culture. Right. And that's, you know, that's tricky. Yeah. I mean, and you see it right now happening with the community colleges in Virginia around textbook zero. Like there's a community emerging based on momentum and that's not easy to do. So kudos to them. I'm, uh, maybe broaden out Jennifer's question a little bit, and because coming from the community colleges, I'm wondering about, and perhaps you guys, if you don't have an answer, maybe someone in the audience does, about sandboxing, about a space, it's, it's something that I don't think we do very well, the community colleges. Um, and so oftentimes we go through this procurement process for a piece of software or platform, and you do your best, and then you get it and it sucks or something's not, you know, doesn't work or didn't do this thing that you didn't think of. Um, and, and so, you know, one broad example is an LMS, right? So you yeah. do your RFP and then you connect it to everything and, oh, you know, whoops, this, this thing doesn't have this thing. And so, um, you know, we've been really looking for a way, and I'm thinking about this, Jim, to your, you know, question about this kind of state infrastructure of a sandbox space to start to connect these larger systems of uh, SIS systems and things to really play with stuff and get a real um, understanding of, of what they can do and what they can do and what the impact is. And I don't know if you have any thoughts about that or if you know of some good examples in other states. I of, do. I mean, I've actually thought a lot about this and I thought a lot about this. Don't talk. <laughs> I thought a lot about this uh, in relationship to. Go ahead. Go ahead. In done? relation, I'm done. I'm done. In relationship. <laughs> okay. I thought a lot about this in relationship to a to a grant uh, we ran through Chev. Um, British Columbia has a program called Open BC, and Open BC deals with exactly this on the resource level, 
the infrastructure level and the pedagogy level. And they provide various schools in British Columbia with infrastructure to explore, maybe Canvas or maybe WordPress. And they also have resources for faculty. They're also working pretty intensely. Clint Lalonde is one example of open resources that they're building as a province. And I'm really compelled by that as an example because I think, you know, the question was raised earlier when the president of TCC spoke about is there something happening in Virginia? And I really strongly believe with the amount of innovation happening around Virginia schools, there is. And the thing, the last piece is to work with the state and to work with Chev to bring that critical mass together and recognize it and actually, to the degree that it doesn't kill it, institutionalize some of that sandboxing and possibility. So British Columbia is a really good example of one way at that. Um, it's not the best, I mean, it's, I don't know if it's the best. It's the only model I know of. Um, you could argue, I think Wiley has done similar stuff in Utah. Um, I don't know the, all the details of that, but the open high school is a perfect example of some of the work he did. But I think BC really thought of it as a kind of institutional, um, province-wide um, uh, initiative that's really remarkable. So, okay, can I can I just say something yes. as a follow-up? <laughs> so yes. no, because this is something I think that we do a really terrible job of, and and I think I, and I actually think like I think one of the things we need to do is to come up with. I, ideas of how to address this, but I think there's a deeper cultural issue that we need to address, which is how we talk about and think about IT and higher education more generally, which is that we have moved into this tendency to look for a product uh, that is engineered for a solution, for a problem that we may or may not fully understand, as opposed to thinking of technology as a tool that we use to investigate ourselves and understand ourselves and then develop ourselves. Um, and the technology isn't the end product, it's the tool that we use. Um, and I think that's a deeper, much more insidious cultural problem that we as a, uh, as a higher ed community need to be grappling with and thinking about. And one way we do that is by providing, uh, providing spaces for experimentation. But until we change the overall mindset about this, those still become kind of side, you know, those still become kind of ancillaries to this overwhelming mindset of we need to procure a solution. And, and I think that's antithetical to education. So that's my sound. Yeah. Can, can I? Rusty, absolutely. Yeah. So let, let me ask just one other perspective of that, because I, I, I get very cautious when we talk about building a Virginia-based open infrastructure, um, and why wouldn't we do that and take advantage of what's happening, you know, nationally and the services that are available, you know, in that that perspective. And I would be more interested in developing and copying you know, repeatable processes like, you know, the, the WordPress on, on Amazon Web Services versus creating a Virginia infrastructure that people can sandbox on. They're Amazon, Azure, Microsoft Azure, Rackspace, they can create infrastructure for us. Uh, we can develop the repeatable processes that can go along with that. But take a also look at the national, you know, initiatives. I don't know if anyone has been following the Unison uh, you know, effort, which is, you know, a collaboration amongst 12 institutions that's creating this digital learning eco, you know, system that goes from platforms for delivery, you know, platforms for content repository sharing, platform for analytics that's open that can be, you know, you plug in, you, you know, whatever solution works and, you know, maybe doing something even at that perspective as opposed to just within uh, Virginia. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, no, I, I just want to sort of take this back to what I feel is, was an interesting and uh, sort of very dramatic juxtaposition between the last session and this session. Um, and I guess if you remember the, the, the book, um, Faculty Are From Mars, IT Is From Venus. Um, Are you going to go well again? Oh, it was, different, it was different than that? Um, but that's sort of... You know, from, from, from a faculty perspective, which is where I come, you know, even the, the, those of us who are adventurous faculty, we want to do stuff. Mm -hmm. And to, it's like, okay, so we should just be able to do whatever that is. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, at the IT side, depending upon the, the level of support, it's okay, how do we help you do that? Or you can't do that because of all these things that that you guys were talking about that most of which after a certain while I heard a buzzing in my ears. 
because I wasn't understanding a lot of the. I'm hearing that right now. With you. I, exactly <laughs> right. <laughs> you know where I'm coming from, Jim. But but I guess the question is, we you know, and, and to basically go back to what Martha was saying. I mean, at the end of the day, we're trying to do something. We're we're trying to get something specific accomplished, and and how do we get the divide from where IT might be coming from? As as Rusty just brought up, you know, we say, let's be open. And Rusty says, hang on. Because you know, there's issues involved with that. There's a lot of complications. But how do we get to the point where there's a, there's a commonality of the language that we're speaking so that these things can move forward smoothly without the, the, um, the, the translation problems and, and that sort of thing? I'll start. I mean, some people can jump in here. But one of the things I realized quickly, and this is our first real exposure to Amazon Web Services, and I think led to you in those blogs, is we had three faculty in the computer science department who wanted to play with edX. They wanted to see what that was like as a platform. It's open source. It doesn't run on a LAMP stack, so we couldn't do it on domain of one's own. Tim Owen said, well, why don't we just open up an EC2 instance, because there's an image on Amazon that it will take us five seconds to basically install and have up and running. So within 20 minutes of being requested, we could send our faculty logins for an edX instance that they could play with that we paid two dollars for to experiment with for four days. That kind of rapid prototyping of the sandbox blew my mind and it's where we came back and said we have to as an ed tech group and maybe as an IT group more broadly start experimenting with what this means for our community. And that really I think Andrew is what started that. I see faculty needing that and as Rusty said, you know, with the old infrastructure, we really couldn't respond nearly as quickly. With a new infrastructure, it really changes dramatically what we're able to do for our faculty. And it's always been a DTLT's kind of motto to try and say yes as much as we possibly could, because we want to be seen as kind of enablers for thinking beyond the LMS. And so that really, when we saw that, and Tim Owens really kind of opened that whole world up to us, we said we're going to dive in and play with it. And that's kind of why I was hoping this, this panel would exist, if that makes any sense. I, I, think, I think part of this is about sort of flipping the paradigm that so often what you hear about in the news is technology companies sort of taking advantage of the educational sector for either money or for data or for whatever. And it's sort of about flipping that and saying, well, OK, but we're education. And what are you doing for businesses that we can take advantage of? of that rapid prototyping of AWS, which was not built for educational institutions, but holds a lot of promise for us to be able to, to do and to respond quickly yeah. to things. So how do we think about, OK, what's out there? What infrastructure is there that maybe isn't being marketed or geared toward us, but that we can really take advantage of? I think that's a big part of it. Kim. So, and then Chris, we'll have you next. So I, and, and I'm interested in, I, I sense that there's a little bit of a difference maybe between Mary Washington and, and what ODU or what Southside might, might say to this, but one of the challenges that we really struggle with, and I listen to you guys working around it because we, we really struggle with this, you know, connecting up of systems, sharing of data across systems, and, and you know, admittedly, Canvas does provide some opportunities there that ease that relative to some of the older LMSs, and yet, yeah. It's, it's still not seamless and there's a lot of complexity there. So it seems to me that you have a strategy in place that is you're very comfortable with these systems being loosely, if at all, coupled, running into each other or overlapping with each other, and that that is a kind of environment of experimentation that is, is comfortable. And yet, in my experience, that's pretty unusual, and I'm, I'm interested a little bit in the trade-offs that the different institutions have made about you know, how much is this you know, bringing pieces together into something that is, is cohesive and yet complex to a point of being almost unachievable versus allowing it to be more free-flowing and less managed, but the complexity and confusion and redundancy that can come out of that. Sorry, that's yeah. one of those questions that just can't be restated. And this, and this kind of goes back to a previous question where, I, you know, the first, I came into this job five years ago from K-12, and I came in with a hundred things in my toolkit, and I got to use maybe three of them. Because of the complexities that you're talking about, uh, in the Virginia Community College system, the 
all the student data, Blackboard, it's all hosted way up there, and we're way down here. And so when I wanted to roll out WordPress, WordPress to the college for, for the students, and there was a problem with integrating the data in the Blackboard, just like was mentioned before. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it was kind of just kiboshed. It was just, that's it. Um, I'm sure that if we had to discuss, now this was years ago, I'm sure if we had the discussion now, um, we could probably work something out. Uh, Richard, you can probably. <laughs> I don't want to say too much because I could get in trouble in the room, you know what I'm saying? Uh, uh, <laughs> but, but we do, uh, it's, a, you know, it's an amazing system that they have up, up there. It's at four million student records at any given time uh, that we have to communicate with. And there is always a little bit of barrier of entry, yeah. I, I, think, that, um, I think that's kind of a constant dance that we're doing, this, this idea, this, this desire for integration, which can be a really beautiful thing when you achieve it and when you do it well. Um, but this understanding, too, that sometimes with integration, you lose the beauty of complexity and the opportunity of complexity. And so I think that's a dance that we're constantly doing. The other piece of it, though, that I, and maybe that's a, this is a little bit like Pollyanna-ish of me, but I, I feel really strongly that the technologies that we use in the classroom should to the degree possible, be representative of the technologies of the world, like the technologies that are beyond the walls of our institution. And that we don't do our students a great deal of service when we spend their time using tools and systems that are completely irrelevant and inauthentic. Um, and <laughs> thank you. And the fact of the matter is that, um, that out in the real world, um, things aren't integrated. <laughs> like the, the technologies of the world aren't aren't integrated, they are loosely coupled. And, and, and they're becoming more beautifully loosely coupled every day through, through various integrations and APIs and things like if this then that. And, yeah. you know, that, and those are, that's exciting to me, the fact that people can kind of emp become empowered to, to join together the spaces that they work in. And I think that's a model that, that we need to try and keep in our minds as opposed to this eye of the, this model of the tightly locked down, integrated data moving swiftly from one place to one place to one place without any interruption. Um, I think that's something that we become enamored with because it is such a beautiful idea. But then when we really talk about what it means and what's lost if we don't do it, that in the analysis, what's gained by not doing it may be greater. You know, what's gained by loosely coupling and, and become, becoming a little frenetic occasionally with our use of technology is more beautiful um, than, than the beauty of, of that tightly run ship. So. And the, the idea that you know we would all have different answers to this question, I think, is it'd be boring if we all said the same thing, right? <laughs> um, but no, I mean that's our, our strength is in our diversity um, here in the state, right? We at UMW, Tim Owens mostly, have, have figured out how to purchase domains on an ongoing basis through state purchasing processes. That's something we can contribute to the larger um, conversation, right? Another school may figure out how do you integrate WordPress with Blackboard. How do you do these other, you know, how do you, if we all sort of take a, a niche little thing and figure out how to do it and then share that information, we don't have to sort of struggle alone. We can figure out these issues while not having these sort of behemoth, um, you know, structures, monolithic structures. Yeah, yeah exactly. And I just want to mention it is becoming easier. Ten years ago mm -hmm. when I implemented yeah. Google, you know, at the very beginning of Google in education, at, in K-12, I implemented that. It had no Active Directory integration whatsoever. You had to sign in differently. Now you have that. Um, and and 10 years ago, I wasn't able to uh, use ODU. We have ODU at our college as well, and they're part of Eduroom. And we can mm -hmm. actually piggyback off of that and, and use their wireless at our location so students don't have to bounce between wireless. So it's getting better. It's just uh, slow steps to innovation, I guess. One, one, we meet with a lot of student groups and ask them about their use of technology and one of the top things they ask us is can't you make this all work together? Can't you make it seamless? Can't you make it easier mm -hmm. for us mm -hmm. to go from one system to another and know how to use the technology? So, um, you know, if you talk to the students, there's got to be some level of simplification of understanding where, mm -hmm. where we go. The same thing happens when I talk to faculty. In particular, when you talk about research uh, faculty who are using computational resources to say, I want to take advantage of the computation on campus. I want to be able to scale out to the supercomputing facilities at Pittsburgh, but I don't want to have to go and you know, use it here, get an account over here, figure out how I'm going to get my data there, 
run my job, move it back down. Can't you just make that work? That happens with integration. That's what you want too, right? All right. So <laughs> that happens with integration. That happens when you have a common federated directory like in common that you can use your credentials local at supercomputing facilities at Pittsburgh. You have a common file data transfer tool that uses the that goes across the, you know, the, the uh, uh, on campus, off campus. That's what happens. It, it becomes seamless, and when it becomes seamless, it becomes an enabler, and it get and it gets used. So it goes both ways, right? I mean, I understand, you know, the the, the concept of you know the, the the sandbox, the exploration, and getting beyond the you know the four walls that people think IT like to put you in. But uh, you know, the idea of making it seamless and work and scale and flow uh, comes with, you know, with tightly coupled integration, right? I think EduRoom is a great example of that, yeah. right? So EduRoom is a federated wireless authentication system that we've implemented on our campus. And if your campus implements EduRoom, so they authenticate to my, our credentials at ODU, if your campus uh, implements EduRoom, when our faculty show up on your campus, it's going to all authenticate them to the wireless back to ODU, and they're going to be on the wireless. They don't have to say, what's your guest uh, username, password? It just works. So if you implement EduRoom on your campus, yeah. it, we would have a way that everybody could connect uh, to the wireless infrastructure without guest access. That's integration. But see, here's an example that I would give. And and, and there are lots of reasons why people would push back on why we, w why we wouldn't do this. But I'm going to throw it out there anyway because I think it's kind of illustrative. We spend a lot of time in our institutions thinking about this notion of single sign-on, right? Like getting to the point where you, with, with one, one directory, one network directory, you can sign into and, and in some cases stay signed into all of these various services because password management, everybody knows, is just, it's horrible, right? Well, what if instead of investing our time into that, we invested our time into teaching our students how to, how to use a password manager, which is a real life example of how we manage our identity on the open web, right? Like that's an actual really useful digital skill for our students to have because they're terrible at making passwords. They're, nobody ever remembers their passwords if you don't use it every day. Um, so instead of investing our resources and we need to integrate, 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 what if we invest our time and our energy into we need to educate people in how we create strong passwords, how we manage our identity, how we secure our identity, and how we use the tools, the real world tools of identity management that are out there, like password managers, that will help us once we graduate. Can you give us that <laughs> <laughs> We have a question up here from Chris, and this is great discussion, keep it coming. Well, I want to thank the panel for uh, their great discussion. My question has evolved as our conversation has evolved, but, um, this is what I've been wondering, is the, the students that are coming up in the next 10, 15 years, uh, they will have, um, those who have middle class lifestyles and above, will have some sort of digital identity. Mm -hmm. And um, currently, uh, LMS systems, whether we talk about Blackboard or Canvas or even OpenEdX, are decoupled from those digital identities mm -hmm. that students will be arriving for mm -hmm. our campus. In many ways, the LMS, um, as a, uh, and I appreciated Martha's comment about technology, as a technology is very instructor centric. It's essentially an administrative uh, management system that is designed to help instructors do their job, faculty like me, but it's not very student centric. And my question for the panel is about this notion of digital identity in the next 10, 15 years. As we think about students who are arriving on our campuses who have these digital identities um, and how those digital identities then connect to their learning on our campuses in what David Wiley calls open learning networks as opposed to what we think of as a traditional LMS. And so what you, the panel thinks are as you look in the next 10 to 15 years about this notion of digital identity and the potential implications for um, LMS and, and how we think about that. Um, I guess I can start with part of that. Um, that's, that's actually really important to us, um, thinking about digital identity of, of students that they have coming in and then what digital identity do they build sort of coming out. And that's actually one thing that um, is different for lots of different kinds of people. Um, and we're actually working on sort of starting to have discussions at that about Mary Washington of like, what does it mean to be online? Like, let's forget about the tools for just a second. Like, these tools are important for us to, to teach students, but 
let's just take a step back and say, okay, what does it mean to be online and to be a person of color? What does it mean to be online and to be a woman? What does it mean to be, you know, it, so, so sort of situating that from individual students' point of view, um, to start having those discussions so that we can start sort of preparing not only for the students who are coming in who are, you know, becoming more and more diverse, but then how do we actually help our current students think about that for themselves? One of the things that we do in the current Domain of One's Own program, which I'll let Martha talk about in a sec, is um, have people, we have them Google themselves and say, okay, what is out there about you? But then we actually try to educate them about the way the web works. And so how do you actually use the algorithms that Google uses to populate a search engine? How do you use those to your advantage? And, and how do you actually do that? And that's not something that students come in knowing. They know how to put stuff up on Facebook, they know how to you know, maybe create a blog on Blogger or somewhere, but they don't understand the sort of mechanical, mathematical underpinnings that make all of this happen. And so that's really important to us to sort of say, okay, this is not something that's being taught in high school or below. Maybe it should be, but it's not. How do we address that? Um, not only for incoming students, but the ones who are currently here. Yeah, I would say that I would hope that five to 10 years out that in, at all of our schools, this, this concept of digital identity and understanding our, our digital identity is part of our curriculum. Yeah. That that's something that we've built in as a curricular component. And I think that's, you know, I think that's a little bit controversial in some ways because, I mean, I, I don't think it's controversial. I think it's obvious, but um, I can understand why for some people it might not be. Um, but I, I, because it seems, it seems sort of extracurricular. Like it seems like something that, yeah, sure, our students are online and they've got an identity and that's something they have to figure out, but that's like learning to balance a checkbook. Like you gotta figure that out, we're not gonna teach you a class on that. But I don't think that's true. I think that in order to function as a, as a contributing member of our society um, at this point, we need, we need to be educating our students to deeply understand the way the internet and the web work and how their identity is formed and shared um, and, and, and the challenges of that formation and sharing for them. Um, and and I, I think we're getting there. Like I think I see more and more um, you know, places that are, that are beginning to think about that stuff in really deep curricular ways, but I hope that, that we, see, we just see more and more examples of that. And, and in terms of the LMS, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, Domain of One's Own in some ways was a response to that for us because it was a way to give, not, not, be, not to say we're, never gonna, we're, we're done with the LMS, um, but, to, but to say that there is also a space that we need that is open and public, and we need to teach our students what it means to be open and public in responsible ways. Like, well, how do they do that in a way that's, that's responsible and safe and, and, and mature, um, and, and not do that at the, the detriment, to, you know, at the expense of the LMS, but to do it in a way that when they graduate, they have this identity of their academic life at, at, at Mary Washington that they can, if they want, take with them and build on. I think in many cases, if the goal of the LMS is collaboration, it's failing already. And if it doesn't catch up in 10, I mean, my kids are going to be in college in 10 years. Uh, if it doesn't catch up, they're going to do exactly what they do now, which is go on Facebook and create a group and, and do the collaboration there instead. Um, so something's going to have to change. I have no idea what that is. <laughs> Instagram. Instagram, that's what you <laughs> You know, the big, you know, what on the other side is, I mean, how do you trust that, that identity, right? Uh, Europe is well ahead of us uh, right now when it comes to, you know, uh, identity and trust of identity and being able to say, you, you come in with this identity, it's an authoritative source, we're going to trust it. Um, and how do, how do we go about doing that? That's, I think that's another big part of, you know, the uh, online identity is to trust of it. I think that's a great point. And one of the last things I'll just throw out there in terms of people who I think are thinking about this is there's a movement right now called the Indie Web Camp. And the Indie Web Camp are actually um, relating your notion of identity to the domain you have. And they're doing some really interesting things about pushing people to take more responsibility and control over the spaces in which they publish and over the data that they publish. And so this is a movement right now that's not isolated, and I think they're thinking very hard, Chris, about what the next 10 or 15 years. So if you are interested in these questions, check out the folks at Indie Webcam. 
Yeah, I know we're almost out of time here, but, um, but I, I, so this will be more of a comment than a question. We've been talking a lot about students in the, the direction that this turn has gone, and I think it's also really important to think about where faculty fit into all of this. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's part of what your question is getting at. How do you get people into Word, how do you get faculty to use WordPress and things like that? I mean, one of the things, and I'm from Mary Washington, so this is not an unbiased comment, but, um, <laughs> uh, but one of the things about, uh, that I think has been particularly successful uh, at Mary Washington is that, uh, DTLC has run a number of faculty initiatives in which they've, they've brought faculty into the domain of one's own project and, and work, walked with them through a curriculum of what it means to be online, right? So, so these things we're talking about teaching students, <laughs> we also have to teach faculty um, who are not getting any of this in graduate school, right? And so even, even people who are just emerging from graduate school are not getting uh, this training. And so providing that information and providing that support and providing that, um, um, you know, uh, uh, space to play for faculty is, is what gets faculty to then integrate that into their own classes and to understand better why these things matter, um, how this is important for their students, and why, regardless of their discipline, this is an integral part of what they need to be working with students on. So. And yeah, thank you for saying that, Jeff, because that yeah. just made me realize that is the answer. Like that, <laughs> that you know, um, when we've done this, we've done this faculty initiative for domains the last two years, and it is amazing to me. There, there have been other times when we've done kind of innovative stuff for technology, and faculty kind of look at us side eye, like, why would I do that? Like, what what's the benefit of that? That looks like a lot of work. It is amazing to me how once they understand it, part of it is the name thing. Yeah. The idea of owning a domain name, like something happens when you name things. Yeah. Um, and, and the idea of owning a space that, 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 that they've chosen a name for and that they're building their own professional identity out on, it clicks for them. Like, and it's amazing, actually, yeah. with both groups that we've had, how many of them, people who, who were completely new to really teaching with online tools at all, it, you know, that that, that, that was, or even against, yeah, yes, right. even people who, who weren't even sure they should be a part of this group yes. um, got that. And I think that may be, the, the first thing is convincing faculty that this concept of digital identity and then these literacies is crucial to them. And as a result, it is also crucial to the students who they're teaching. Right, and, and sort of going back to what, um, what Martha was saying before about you know, how technology is a tool that um, you shouldn't necessarily be scared of it. You know, one of the best ways, if there's stuff on Google about you that you don't want, the best way to get it off is not to ask Google to take it down, it's to flood with the information you do want, right? Like that's the way that you make that happen. And so if, if you're gonna be online, and you are gonna be online, unless you are, you have to go way out of your way to not have anything about you online, right? You have to police like everyone you know, don't put pictures of me up, you know, it's hard. So instead of that, you can be really proactive and sort of getting people to think about that shift um, in, in doing faculty initiatives, doing even doing some student-focused stuff, approaching them through the curriculum um, really, really helps sort of flip that switch in people's heads. And I think one of the last Rather. points to think about is, you know, there is an infrastructural need for this. We used to have the tilde spaces, remember them? And they would go and you put your HTML page, you wouldn't change it for 16 years, so your newborn baby was actually 16 years old, but you were still with the newborn baby. Um, and that was great, right? Like, it was that kind of moment of the web. But a lot of us actually, because of that infrastructure, never really updated it. So our faculty didn't really have spaces to own, whether it's related to UMW.edu, Tilda J. Groom, they didn't really have these spaces to manage and control their identity. So a lot of what Domain of One's Own offered is something that I think had been missing and people were going to wordpress.com or to mm -hmm. Blogger, but I firmly believe they either are attached to their own namespace or they still want to be attached to the university namespace. Mm -hmm. So there's also an infrastructural point of how are we supporting this process at our universities and are we giving them access to applications like WordPress, you know, applications like MediaWiki, et cetera. Like, and it's not that hard to do it now. So that's an actually interesting question. Okay. I'd like to thank our panel. Uh, we are getting close to lunchtime now, so I appreciate um, all the interesting conversation, and I hope that you will continue this at lunch. Um, just a couple of notes for lunch. Um, some of you requested vegetarian or gluten-free meals, and those are on a special table over by the window. Uh, you are welcome to take your lunch uh, into room 304 here where there's tables and chairs set up. If you want to get outside for a little bit, on the second floor of the Student Center is an outdoor cafe area. 
with table and chairs. Uh, the facility people asked if you would take everything with you, though, for lunch. We are actually going to switch out the chairs during lunchtime, so when you come back for our afternoon session, the chairs are much more comfortable. <laughs> so <laughs> I'd like to thank Martha, Ryan, Rusty, and Chad for their presentations this morning. And we'll see you back here at 1230.